Well, thank you for joining us at our 950 worship service. Those of you who are in person, glad that you chose to be in worship with us today. Also, those who are watching online, glad you could join us. We're continuing a sermon series out of the Old Testament book of Ruth, entitled Ruth, Seeing God's Heart of Love. And today we're in chapter 2. We're doing one chapter a week, four weeks during this month of February, in which we celebrate Valentine's Day. And today's message is Love Expressed with Kindness out of Ruth chapter 2. Have you ever heard of the Chuck Cunningham Syndrome? The Chuck Cunningham Syndrome. Sometimes on a TV series, you will see an actor who plays a role, but then the role disappears. How many of you here remember the old sitcom Happy Days? Let me see your hands. All right, several of you, quite a few, very good. That popular sitcom ran from 1974 to 1984, had 255 episodes in its 11-season run. And if I mention the name of Richie, many of you will remember that. Remember, he was played by... Ron Howard, very good. If I mention the name Fonzie, most of you will remember that. He was played by Henry Winkler, yeah. But if I mention the name Chuck, do you remember who played him? Chuck Cunningham was Richie and Joni's older brother and was played by three different actors. Rick Carrot in the pilot, Gavin O'Harely in the first season, and then Randolph Roberts in the second season. But Chuck was rarely seen and he just disappeared without explanation. It was in that second season that Fonzie really became the regular character effectively replacing Chuck Cunningham. And what happened to the character Chuck Cunningham has given rise over the years in the acting industry of the term the Chuck Cunningham Syndrome. It describes TV characters who were dropped from shows, they were forgotten, and with later shows of that or late episodes of that show scripted as if the character had never existed. Now, I share that little bit of TV trivia because I want to treat the passage we're in today somewhat like a TV episode. We're in the Old Testament book of Ruth, chapter 2, or episode number 2, and the show's going to have only four episodes total, and it's not until the very last word in the book that we really learn the reason for its being included in the Bible. So that's kind of the cliffhanger part of the series, is that you'll have to wait until two weeks today to learn how all that connects. But in the first episode, of Ruth, there's already a character who has been removed. Her name is only mentioned twice, and it's in the first chapter, and her name is Orpah. And while that character in Scripture is never mentioned again, she actually has a namesake among us. You've heard of Oprah Winfrey. Her actual name on her birth certificate was Orpah, but few knew how to pronounce it or how to spell it properly. She was named after Orpah in the Old Testament book of Ruth, but nobody knew about it, and so they then started calling her Oprah. So the book of Ruth obviously gives the prominent character figure to its namesake, Ruth, and whose name, as mentioned by Matt last week, means friendship. But episode one of Ruth gives us the setting in which she, her sister-in-law Orpah, and her mother-in-law Naomi find themselves, and the setting is one of tragedy. The setting opens with a famine in Bethlehem, and a man named Elimelech takes his wife and two sons to live in the country of Moab to save their lives. But Elimelech dies, and Naomi still has her two sons. Now, the two sons, Malon and Kilion, get married. Malon marries Ruth, which we don't discover that she marries that one until chapter 4, but about a decade or so into the marriages, both their husbands die, leaving Ruth and Orpah widows like their mother-in-law, Naomi. Now, you need to understand in that day, there was not much assistance for a woman in that day when her husband had died, especially if she had lost her sons. And that's where Naomi finds herself. She lost her husband and she lost both of her sons which in that day basically meant she needed to prepare to die. Naomi heard that the long famine in Judah was over, and she decides to return there, hoping she might possibly find a relative who would help her. So both daughters-in-law actually start the journey with her, but Naomi encourages them to return to their respective mothers. Now, Orpah does just that, but Ruth decides to stay with her mother-in-law. Now, I think Orpah was just being practical. Instead of going to a place where she had no familiarity, she went back to her mother and her father's where she knew she would at least have some provisions, or maybe she was going to start her own daytime talk show, whatever it might be. 
But as episode two begins, we have Naomi with her daughter-in-law Ruth entering Bethlehem. Now, for our purposes this morning, I want us to go through episode number two of Ruth, seeing the people, the plot, and the program. We're going to see God's heart of love and his heart of love being expressed with kindness through one of the cast members. So let's turn on our mental TVs. Let's get tuned in for the next episode of Ruth, seeing God's heart of love. Well, there are three basic characters under the people part in Ruth episode two. Now remember, Orpah was written out like in the first episode. First, there is Naomi. Now, Naomi is a very perceptive woman. She knew she would not last very long remaining in the land of Moab and that she needed to return to Judah to her hometown of Bethlehem. She had left Bethlehem with her husband due to a famine, but now that is over and we'll see the town is once again going to live up to its name, which means means house of bread. And at the end of the first episode, Ruth and Naomi get to Bethlehem just as the harvest is beginning. I want you to hold that in your mind because it becomes very important here in just a minute. The second character in episode number two is Ruth herself. She's the star of the show. And while Naomi is a very perceptive woman, Ruth is a very productive woman. Go to Ruth chapter two, and we're going to start actually with verse two. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. Now, their first day in Bethlehem, and Ruth's already thinking about breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Now, if you vacation and you arrive at your destination late in the evening, you've been driving all day, what do you want to do? Well, you want to go to eat. Eleven years ago this month, Barb and I got to go to Hawaii for eight days, and we arrived in Honolulu late on a Thursday night. It was about midnight, their time, and we just collapsed. But the very first thing the next morning, people say, what did you do the first thing when you got to Honolulu? We went to Walmart. We are so exciting. We went to Walmart to buy food for breakfast every morning. We had a little kitchenette in our room, and so we bought milk and we bought cereal. And I can remember 11 years ago, we paid about $8 for each of them because of the prices of Hawaii, and it was cheaper than going out for breakfast. Now, up to this point, we don't know much about Ruth's work ethic, but obviously it was very strong, and whether she's accustomed to hard work or not, we don't know. Maybe she's just going to the fields to keep her from her and her mother-in-law starving, but it's a way to demonstrate her love to her mother-in-law is providing food for both of them. You know, everybody has a different kind of love language. If my wife's had a rough day and we get home, maybe I've been here at the church all day at the appointments and working on the sermon. And maybe she's been in the back at our preschool preparing for the next day of her preschool class. And, and we get home and if I can tell she's frustrated or just exhausted, I can speak her love language and I can ask her a question, do you want to go to Cracker Barrel? And that is always good. I know what her love language is. Ruth was going to glean. Gleaning is the act of collecting leftover crops from a farmer's field after they have been commercially harvested or on fields where it's no longer economically profitable for the harvest. So for all practical purposes, gleaning in that day was the way that the wealthier could provide for the poor. Because you see, after the harvest was done, there would be some leftovers of the harvest laying there in the field. So a gleaner would come in and they would clean the field completely up. That would help the owner out. And the one gleaning would get to keep the food and have some dignity in the work because it was not a handout. One commentator wrote, it was a way to provide dignity for those who could work and not rummage through the garbage. Now, enter character number three, Boaz. Now, Boaz, his name means strength. Boaz is a very prominent individual. Ruth 2 verse 1. Now, Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. At the end of verse 3, it says, As it turned out, she, that's Ruth, was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Now, due to the tragedies in Moab, Ruth has spent more time than she should have in cemeteries. But now she's in a field that's going to produce a harvest. In fact, this field is going to mean new life for herself and for her mother-in-law. And ladies, this is where in the TV show, Ruth, you'd be watching with great anticipation as you've seen the teaser commercials about the male star of the show, Boaz. And the Bible says he was a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech. This man is going to be larger than life. He's well-respected. 
He is wealthy. For Ruth and Naomi, he's a distant relative who might be able to help them out. In the Hebrew, it's really interesting. Uh, The Old Testament's written in Hebrew, and in the Hebrew language, the phrase, a man of standing here, is the phrase, ish kabor she'al. It is significant. It means that Boaz was a warrior-type person with a body build to match that. And just as he was strong physically, he was also strong financially, all right? So, ladies, you would be watching for Boaz to appear on the screen. To give you a perspective about Boaz and his looks, Boaz was a hunk, all right? I'm a chunk. He was a hunk, all right? Keep these two straight. But there's a little side story here to Boaz you need to remember. Now remember, he's in Bethlehem. Bethlehem is a very small village. You know the good thing about a small town, don't you? Everybody knows everybody. You know the bad thing about a small town, don't you? Everybody knows everybody. And everybody in Bethlehem knew who Boaz's parents were. His father, Salmon, is famous for that, just being the father of Boaz. But Boaz's mother was famous for something else. She's the prostitute from Jericho. Preacher Albert Tate of Southern California says that Rahab was one of the first initiators of a small group. In fact, he says, you know, you have to kind of think out loud about this. He he said Rahab was, uh, she was a woman who, uh, how would you say this? She formed her own men's ministry. That was her job, all right? Now, in this part of the episode, Ruth knows nothing about Boaz, but she's going to very soon. Now, even in tragedy, God can work in the lives of people and make opportunities available for the hurt to be lessened. If you've lost a loved one, a spouse, a child, a parent, you've experienced the loss of property or finances, maybe even due to bankruptcy, maybe you've seen your job disappear, even through all that hurt, God can still show up if you'll allow him. And Ruth was faithful to her mother-in-law, and she knew to do only one thing, go to work to provide food. She did what she knew to do, and she trusted God to orchestrate the things she didn't know. I imagine every one of us here could look back in our lives and see where God has worked. You could easily see where God's heart of love has ultimately prevailed. Back in the mid-1980s, I was at a men's festival of faith at my alma mater, Kentucky Christian College, and I heard a group sing called the Cane Ridge Revival, and I bought one of their cassette tapes. I looked on the back of that cassette tape, and I saw the name of a town of which I'd never heard before, just like everybody pronounces it when they first see it. I saw the name of Patascala, Ohio. And about three years later, I got a call from two guys named Bill Hayes and Herb Wired, and those names rang bells in my head for some reason, and I thought, I have seen those names in print somewhere, and I pulled out that cassette tape, and their names are on the back of that cassette tape. And Bill Hayes said to me, my name is Bill Hayes, I'm calling from Pataskala, Ohio, near Columbus, our church needs a preacher, would you be interested? But Bill had no idea earlier that day, I had told my wife in the ministry where we were then, if I don't find another ministry by December, and this was in July, I am going to leave the ministry altogether. And now for the last almost 32 years, I've lived in Patascala, Ohio. Now, if I had had quit ministry, if I didn't keep doing what I knew to do, I'd have no idea where I'd be right now, have no idea what I'd be doing. And let me say those to you here today who are going through a struggle. Do what you know is still right to do, even when you don't feel like it. You do what you know is right to do. Because when you do, I think God will, you will see God's love expressed with kindness to provide. Well, we've learned about the characters. Let's look at the plot. In scene one, we have Ruth meets Boaz. Look down at verse four. Just then Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, who does that young woman belong to? Now, by the way, the King James Version of the Bible is a lot more glamorous about Boaz making his entrance. In the King James, it says, and behold, Boaz. All right? 
it says, behold, this guy. The first words we hear from him are, the Lord be with you. Not only is Boaz strong and wealthy and influential, he is devoted to God. And Boaz is scanning his field. He sees the workers he's paying. He sees the people who are behind them who are gleaning. And he suddenly sees somebody he's never seen in his field before. And he does not ask, who is she? Rather, he says, who does that young woman belong to? By the way, the use of the word young here implies that it's someone under 30. Boaz was probably a little bit older than Ruth. We don't know by how many years. By the way, have you ever noticed that someone older, someone old, is a person who's at least 10 years older than you are? Have you ever noticed that? When you're 50, it's somebody who is 60 years old. When you're 60, it's somebody who is 70 years old. When you're 70, it's somebody who is 80. When you're 80, it's somebody who is 90. That's the old person. Now, what Boaz is asking is very simple. He says, is she spoken for? I wonder what caught his attention. Was it her work ethic? Was it her beauty? Verse 6. The overseer replied, she is the Moabite, the Moabite who, came back, who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field, and she's remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. I think Boaz's form was caught off guard by the question, and his, his boss says, hey, who is this? And she go, he goes, she's a Moabitess who came from Moab. Duh, if she's a Moabitess, of course she came from Moab. And here's Ruth's foreignness is emphasized, but the foreman is aware Ruth is gleaning for two, herself and her mother-in-law, and Boaz finds that Ruth's unselfish act of kindness is really very unselfish. So we quickly move to scene two, where we have Boaz gives special protection to Ruth. Look down at verse eight. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with a woman who works who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you, and whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and mother and your homeland, and you came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you've done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Boaz now wants Ruth not to hang out with the other female gleaners, but those who are working for him. And knows that Boaz does not want Ruth to be around the male workers. I wonder why. You see, Ruth started out as a foreign immigrant in the morning, but by the afternoon she's now a trusted employee. Boaz was protecting Ruth physically, emotionally, and even sexually. When he told his men, do not lay a hand on her, it implies the men might coerce Ruth sexually. That gives us, by the way, another perspective of the man Boaz here in his character. Because Ruth comes right after the book of Judges, right before First and Second Samuel, and in the book of Judges and in the books of First and Second Samuel, those books say that the the people of God were doing whatever they thought was right in their own eyes. And they had become a very corrupt people and a very corrupt society. And during this time of corruptness, Boaz still chooses to be a very godly man. And Boaz knows the story of what Ruth had done for her mother-in-law Naomi, how she traveled to Bethlehem, leaving her own country, her own culture. And not only was Boaz protecting Ruth, so was the Lord. He says, under whose wings you've come to take refuge. That's a quote from Psalm 91.4 that says, He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. So Boaz treats Ruth unlike most foreigners were treated. He invited her to eat with him at dinner time. He told his men, you be sure to deliberately leave some of the good grain so she sees it and picks it up for herself. Verse 17. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to about an ephah. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. An ephah is about 30 pounds of grain. And even Ruth's mother-in-law notices this is a lot more than a woman would typically glean in the fields of that day. Naomi knows this is not normal. Ruth is receiving some special attention here. This would be enough grain collected in one day to feed both Naomi and Ruth for at least a month. 
So Ruth's hard work and Boaz's extreme generosity connected together for a feast. And Ruth and Naomi's lives had been through seasons of changes. They experienced a famine. They experienced the loss of their husbands. They had a long journey to an unknown place for Ruth. And after all their tragedy, there seems now to be in their lives a new season for them. And it's not only a season for harvesting grain, it's a season for harvesting God's goodness that they're now receiving. Now, in scene three, we have mother-in-law and daughter-in-law enjoy a turnaround story. Now, at the beginning of Ruth, remember we had three women who could literally starve to death. Now we have two of these women who are still together. They have enough food for a month. Verse 19, her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. Now, the word love, this series talking about love, does not appear until the end of the book of Ruth, but the idea of love is permeated throughout the whole book. Ruth loved her mother-in-law and gave her plenty to eat. Probably for the first time in years, Naomi could eat to her stomach's content. Naomi wants to know where Ruth was gleaning. She learns it's in Boaz's field. That is significant. Verse 20, the Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. Boaz's kindness brings joy back into Naomi's life. If you remember in episode one from last week, her name means pleasantness or joyfulness, but she had changed her name to Mara, meaning bitterness. And the kindness of Boaz sparked a renewed hope within Naomi's heart. If Ruth had not gone along with her to Bethlehem, I think Naomi would still have been lonely cranky, and without Ruth, she would have been ruthless. Okay, we need to take a commercial break right here. You are supposed to laugh at the one-liners, all right? These are to keep you awake. It was Charles Douglas, a sound engineer, who invented laugh tracks. Laugh tracks were highly popular from the late 1950s to the late 1970s, inserting artificial laughter into sitcoms. In fact, there was an experiment done back in the late 60s with the show Hogan's Heroes to test audiences in two versions. One version of Hogan's Hero with a laugh track and one without. And the version without the laugh track failed while the version with laughter was considered a success. Hanna-Barbera. You remember Hanna-Barbera cartoons? growing up on Saturday morning, watching shows like the Flintstones and the Jetsons. Hanna-Barbera used laugh tracks for those cartoons. Now, what Naomi was experiencing was not just laughter. It was a joyful heart for God's kindness being expressed to her and to Ruth. Boaz was a guardian or a kinsman redeemer. Now, a kinsman redeemer was a family member, sometimes very distant, who could step in and help out another family member. Often, it was rescuing a relative from a financial ruin due to some tragedy, which certainly Naomi and Ruth had experienced. But their financial support, remember, disappeared when their husbands died. But Naomi knew Boaz would maybe now step in and help them. When our son was born in January of 1989, we thought we were insured medically, but the company we were with went bankrupt during that month. And months later, as collectors started calling us about long overdue medical bills, a relative of mine stepped in and assisted us financially. Just to give you the picture, the total of the bills we owed for our son's birth was $6,000. My annual salary was $12,000. So we owed 50% of an annual salary. And the relative told me, he said, you just pay me back as you can. I told him, I said, we will, but if we can't make payments, you repossess Adam and you feed him. And that'll work out. He never did repossess him. But that relative helped us out several more times. When we bought our house, he helped us out. When we bought a second vehicle, when we needed to replace the roof on our house, when Adam needed braces, and thankfully, we were able to pay back all those debts that we owed my uncle a few years before he died. But as the second episode of Ruth ends, there's not a lot of fanfare. There's not like this big cliffhanger statement out there. In fact, it's a very simple statement. If you look at the very last sentence in verse 23 of Ruth chapter 2, it says, and she, that's Ruth, she lived with her mother-in-law. That's it. Not a big excitement ending there, is there? She lived with her mother-in-law. Some of you are thinking, no, that would not be an excitement ending for my life either. 
Uh, she lived with her mother. It sounds like a punchline to a stand-up comic. And she lived with her mother-in-law. That's what she did. But it's a statement of contentment that Ruth and Naomi were now experiencing after having so much tragedy in their lives. They can say, God has been good to us and we can be content. Well, here's the program of all this. Two applications that I want to share as we think about how God used the kindness of Boaz towards Ruth. Here's the first one. Look for an opportunity to express kindness this week to someone who needs it. Look for an opportunity to express kindness this week to someone who needs it. You know, one of the characteristics of a person who follows Jesus and has the Holy Spirit in them is kindness. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Do you look for opportunities to express kindness to someone because you have been extended the love of God in your own life? I want you to watch this news clip from, I believe it's Channel 10 News. It's about a minute and a half. Watch this clip. Well, others left out in the cold getting some help from Columbus police officers. And our Kate Seifert found this unique story for us tonight. Kate, what happened? Well, Bob, as you know, the last place you want to be with these freezing temperatures and especially all that snow we got this week is stuck inside your car. But that's exactly where Columbus police officers found a family of three, including a two year old boy. So they helped them find shelter ahead of this week's big winter storm. On Monday, Southside CPD officers Heidi Graber and Aaron Neal were investigating a theft near Rickenbacker Airport. On their route, they encountered a family mom, dad, and young boy. As time went on, we realized they had a two-year-old in the car that was lit. They were all living in the car, and he was just trying to get enough money where they can stay at some extended stays, and then their eventual goal was to get back to Washington State. It was that afternoon that winter weather alerts started coming in. Rain, sleet, snow, then plummeting temperatures all coming to central Ohio. The officers deciding they couldn't leave this family to live in their car through that storm. I mean, being a parent, but both of us, me and my partner, were parents, and um, we were like, we got to put them up. It was just something on my heart, like God just put on my heart. We have to help these people. With the help from the Starfish assignment, the officers were able to give the family $500 so they could stay in a warm hotel for the rest of the week. The dad was like so overcome with joy that he just cried. He couldn't even talk. I mean, it, they were so grateful and they just kept saying, you don't know how much this means to us. Well, the hotel where the family is staying is near where the dad works. He got paid today, but Officer Heidi Graber, who we heard from there, says she is planning on helping them extend their stay into next week if they need it before they make their journey back to Washington. For now, live on your side in downtown Columbus, I'm Kate Seifert, Fox 28 News. I showed that clip for three reasons. First, it really illustrates the point about looking for an opportunity to express kindness. Second, it is a positive shout out to our law enforcement officers who put their lives on the line for us regularly. They're not just present out there to arrest people. They, they do help people. And third, Heidi Graber is one of our members. And she's usually in our third service and usually sits right up here. So you see her in the hallway today. You express your thankfulness for her. But I thought that was a great example of just expressing. And did you, she told me when I talked to her about it the other day, she said, I, I was really shocked they left the part where I mentioned God in there. She goes, so often they cut it out, but they left that part in. You know, your act of kindness may not be putting up a family, mem a family in a hotel for a week. It might be just taking a meal to your next door neighbor who is elderly. It might be giving an overwhelmingly generous tip to a server who's a college student. It might be purchasing school supplies for somebody in elementary school. It might be making phone call to an elderly person who's alone. It might be wrapping your arm around somebody's shoulder, letting them know you're praying for them. Our son lives in the Cincinnati area, and maybe you've heard there's a big game this evening with the Cincinnati team. Have you heard about that? And, and while I was working on this sermon, I, I got an email from La Rosa's Pizza. In fact, I was in Cincinnati all day Thursday for an all-day meeting. And when the guys I was with said, where do you want to go for lunch? I always like to go to La Rosa's. I'm a big La Rosa's fan. And I'm like, we got to go to La Rosa's. So we all went to La Rosa's. Thank goodness somebody else bought. But we, we went there. And while, and while I was working on the sermon this week, I got an email from La Rosa's. And here's what it read. All Sunday afternoon, our awesome team members will be working hard to prepare your La Rosa's favorites with service that will make you smile. But around game time, we'll thank them for their awesomeness and let them go cheer on the mingles with friends and family. Isn't that pretty neat? A corporation like La Rosa's is letting their employees go at 6 o'clock tonight so they can watch the game. But do you realize what the number one earning night for pizza is? It is tonight. 
It is tonight, and they're saying, you know what? Even though this could be our most profitable evening, we're going to let our people go home at 6 o'clock and watch the game. That, that has some validity to it about being kind to other people. And here, you know, maybe you're in a position where you can show kindness to a large group of people, and you can even tell them why. Because God loves me, I'm willing to share that love in a practical manner. You look for an opportunity to express kindness, express kindness this week to somebody who needs that. Number two... Connect your act of kindness to the name of Jesus. Connect your act of kindness to the name of Jesus. Jesus said in Mark 9, 41, Truly I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name, because you belong to the Messiah, will certainly not lose their reward. Let's remember as Christians... We're to point others to Jesus, not us. Matt mentioned our purpose statement, connecting all people to Jesus and one another. Because if we point people to us, they're going to eventually be disappointed. They're going to be confused. But now, eventually, in the book of Ruth, we're going to connect the name of Jesus to it here in a couple of weeks. But remember, Ruth was written before Jesus. We come after Jesus. We can point back to Jesus and say, it's because of Christ I'm doing this. Is there somebody this week you know to whom you can show God's heart of love? Boaz foreshadows Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate kinsman redeemer. He will redeem a bride for himself called the church. Boaz is going to pay for his relatives, Ruth and Naomi. Jesus, as we sang about earlier, paid for our sins, which we could never afford to do for ourselves. And it truly is remarkable of how deep the Father's love is for us. And we celebrate God's heart of love every week when we gather together collectively here in worship and we observe the Lord's Supper. We observe communion, remembering God's heart of love. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your heart of love. And there is no greater expression of that love than when you allowed your son Jesus to die upon the cross God, in this week, we may have some opportunity to express your kindness and your love to other people in some very practical ways. Would you nudge us when need us, when, when we need it? Would, would your Holy Spirit convict us where needed to maybe show an act of kindness, an act of love to someone? May we truly make a difference in other people's lives because of the difference Jesus has made in ours. And we thank you that we can remember again his display of love for us upon the cross. For it's in his name we pray. Amen.